Hello, my beautiful friends. I am Laurel Bleeden Maffei with Illuminating Souls, welcoming you to this episode of Sleepy Bedtime Blessings, a podcast designed to help you rest, relax, and fall asleep, all while deepening in your relationship with your beautiful team of angels who love you so. If we're meeting for the first time, I am an angelic practitioner, a spiritual teacher, and an encourager of souls. And I do this through one-on-one angel sessions. And if you're guided to book a session with me, I almost always can get you in the same week. And all you have to do is go on over to my website and send me a message. So these angel sessions, I also do soul mentoring and a variety of classes designed to inspire your spirit. So lots of ways we can connect. But for now, the angels and I are here to help you come into a deep state of rest and sleep. So I invite you to get cozy in your body. Just take some nice deep breaths in and out. Just allowing yourself to come into a place of relaxation and rest. You have done enough for this day. And the angels are here to bring to you waves of love. Waves of healing and light. And as a result, this broadcast is filled with so much love for you. It's not just the sound you are hearing, but it is the intention. It is the vibration, the energy that we share with you as well. So as I record this, it is early morning here in Vallejo. I live in the San Francisco Bay Area. And the sun hasn't yet come up. And I am underneath the blanket fort. I have this big cozy blanket that I tent over my monitor and my head to help dampen the sound, but it has really become such a sweet sanctuary for the recording of these episodes. I love coming into the blanket fort. I think blankets are wonderful, right? Whether they're big fluffy comforters or afghans. I'm somebody who crochets and so I have crocheted many, many blankets since the pandemic and sent them to people I love. So I like all kinds of blankets, fuzzy blankets, soft blankets. There's just something sweet about getting to be wrapped up or swaddled in warmth and softness that I love. That's why I always say I invite you to cozy on up and snuggle on in, in whatever way delights you. And we'll take some nice deep breaths in and release. And I have a sweet awareness about the angels I want to share with you as we get started. So I've been connecting with the angels very intentionally since the 2000s 
And it's interesting, even though this is my line of work, I also forget to call on them. (laughs) It's not uncommon when I am frustrated by something in my life and I process with my husband and I'm grumbling and worried. He will often say, have you talked to your friends yet? Which is code for, have I talked to the angels yet? And always, if I am in that place, my answer is no, (laughs) no. As if to say, angels, what are angels? Who are angels? You mean I can talk to them? It's as if that part of my consciousness has forgotten. So perhaps we can do a little bit of Angels 101 in this episode. And if you're someone who's listened and been with me for a long time, I know you know this. Just like I know I know this, but aspects of us forget. So angels are divine messengers of God. They are celestial beings and they love us. They're here to support us. It's not like a genie in a bottle scenario where you give them your wishes and they come true. But it has been my experience then when I ask for divine support, more often than not, it arrives in ways that perhaps I hadn't imagined. And as a result, I have come to believe that God takes good care of me and that life has a way of working out, even when I forget that this is true. And here's the thing, if that is true for me, it is true for you as well. I don't believe that God takes good care of me because I am a super special human being, more special than other people. I believe we're all super special. I believe that when we open to this frequency of love, we begin to pivot and shift our consciousness and attention towards brighter frequencies and these loving, compassionate frequencies nurture us. They help us reach for our brighter tomorrows. So I invite you to take a deep breath in and just imagine, believe, allow it to be so that you have a team of angels who love you and they whisper words of encouragement to you They hold for your journey with compassion. They do not judge you and they do not get annoyed by you. They don't do a collective heavenly eye roll when you stumble or ask for help. They open their hearts and they receive you. And so one of the ways To open to this is to ask your angels to bring you signs of magic. And I know it sounds so trite, but you might find feathers in unusual places or messages on the side of a van that passes you in traffic. Or a song comes on the radio that you haven't heard in so long, but the message is for you. Your angels are very creative. So if you'll ask them, angels, send me signs that you're with me. They will. And then you get to be on the lookout for magic, which is a really fun game. (laughs) 
and it brings your angels more closely to you. So the angels are already here, but I am going to call them in so you know they are here as well. So again, get comfortable and let's take a nice deep breath in as we call ourselves forward into the heart of God. And beautiful angels on high, I invite you to join us here. And angels, I ask that you bring a blanket of love to each of our beloveds listening to this message. May you help clear their worries and fears through the heavenly light. May their prayers be heard. May goodness flow to them unhindered. And angels, I ask that you bring forward healing and service to each of our highest and best good. To help clear away any energy that is not ours. And to help imbue each one of us into a sense of joy. To ignite the light of hopefulness. Knowing that something beautiful is blossoming open in each and every one of us. That there are new dreams being born through us new opportunities that we are expanding our comfort zone so that we can show up with even more vibrancy and vitality in the world and to my beautiful friends listening I want to remind you how remarkable you are and this world is filled with big beautiful adventures for you. Even if your life is feeling a little wobbly right now, it does not mean that this will always be your truth. Each of us in our own way is in the midst of a voyage to another expression of life and one that can be filled with so much magic and fulfillment, joyful service on purposeness, I affirm something beautiful is awakening in you while you sleep, <laughs> that while you travel the astral realm, your higher self and your greater self is acclimating to the beautiful dreams of your soul. And courage is awakening within you on purposeness is opening within you in a new and wonderful way. And in this moment, you don't need to figure anything out. You don't need to know what or how. Your soul's GPS already has received the program. And the best way to acclimate to all of these beautiful bright frequencies is to rest. And sleep when you can or when it's your time and just allow yourself to receive the waves of goodness that are here for you. And if there is a way that the angels can help you, let them know. Say, hey angels, can you help clear this fear or anxiousness I've been feeling? Can you help me feel more confident on purpose? Can you help connect me with a sense of vitality and joy? 
whatever those qualities are that you are calling into your heart. Your angels are here to support you. So again, just take a nice deep breath in and let your body know that it has permission to relax and rest. Just allowing the angels to bring to you soothing, comforting energies. You are a blessing here on earth. You are precious. And there is such beauty here for you. I'm so excited for you. There is such brightness within you. And you have wonderful adventures in your future. But for now, it is time to rest. And while you rest, I'm going to tell you a story. So tonight, I thought I would share with you an ode to my sofas. <laughs> it sounds so weird, I have to tell you, but it is amusing me to no end. And um, just so you know, I do have social graces if we were out to lunch or if we were in a social situation. In no way, shape, or form do I think you would be interested in me sharing with you the stories of my many sofas. But since this is a sleep podcast and my intention here is to ramble and tell you stories for the next 45 minutes or so so that you can drift off to sleep, this is going to be a lovely journey that we'll take together and I don't expect you to track with me through every moment or be invested in the story. But after I shared with you the story about my dresser, I realized that so many of the pieces of furniture in my home and in all likelihood in your home have a story to tell. So at first, I was just going to tell you the story of the sofa that we have now. But then I realized I've had a lot of sofas and maybe I could weave all the stories together and see where we would go. And as we start, I will say I use the word couch and sofa interchangeably. And I don't know if they're interchangeable outside of the U.S. or to those of you for whom English is not your first language. But in the vernacular, I'm going to be using a couch and a sofa are the same thing. So if you hear me use the two words, I'm not speaking of something different. They are the same. They're a synonym. So... I'm going to start off with our present sofa, but without telling you the whole story just yet, but if this were a movie, I would start off with my present sofa, and then there would be some kind of groovy transition to my first ever sofa. <laughs> I'm, I'm really having too much fun with this, so, um, <laughs> sorry, I'm laughing with myself. Oh, the sofas I've had. So first, let me tell you about the one that we have right now. So I don't know when it happened, but at some point over the last, I don't know, five or 10 years, but really the last five years for sure, I have segued into a time of life where comfort is far more important to me than style. You know, you don't really, or I should speak for myself, I didn't realize it was really happening. You know, it kind of starts off innocuously, right? I, I work from home. 
And so I don't really have to dress up for anyone anymore. I don't have to put on makeup every day. And especially the first, I don't know, 14 years of my business, I wasn't on video calls like Zoom. It was all over the phone. Once in a while, I would go somewhere in person and then I would put on makeup and dress up. But that was not the everyday thing. You know, at some point comfort went out over style and I didn't wear makeup every day anymore and at some point I embraced having curly hair so I didn't have to style my hair every day and I think the real turning point for me was when I shifted from regular shoes to clogs (laughs) the clogs I'm speaking of are the kind of shoes that people who are on their feet all day wear. Nurses, people who work in restaurants and retail, they are really sturdy and built for comfort and not terribly attractive if we are thinking of shoes as a fashion accessory. At some point, I moved on to clogs. And that, that was it. That was the gateway to functionality and comfort over fashion. And I share that with you because the couch that we have now in our home is the furniture equivalent of clogs. (laughs) It is not attractive, but it is profoundly comfortable. It is one of those power recliner love seats. So it doesn't even really qualify as a couch. It's a love seat with two power recliners and the cup holders in between the two seats. It's a brown fake leather with big rolled arms and I swore I would never have that kind of furniture in my house because at some point in my past I cared deeply about visual aesthetics I cared what things looked like but again at some point clogs became my viable fashion option for my feet and our power recliner love seat with the cup holders and the little container in the middle that flips up where you can put the remotes that became furniture yeah, why, why would I want a couch that isn't comfortable? So I, I need to tell you how we got here. And so I'm going to tell you the story through my many sofas that I have had over the past 40 years of my life. That's a long time. So here we go. So my first kind of sofa that I had in my adult life and it was really my young adult life was when I was probably 21 or 22 and I moved into a one bedroom apartment with one of my girlfriends and so in the single bedroom we had two twin beds and we didn't really have any money for furniture and You know, a lot of times you get hand-me-down furniture, but we didn't really get that (laughs) because nobody was ready to part with a sofa. So what we had was we had two twin mattresses on the floor, not even the box springs, just the twin mattresses on the floor. And at the time, these mattress covers called bed sacks were a big thing. So they were covered in Each was covered in a pink bed sack, which we thought looked super cool. And we had a bunch of pillows. My big extravagance was 
a Papasan chair from Pier 1, which were all the rage back then. It had a blue cushion, a, a gray blue cushion on it. And that was really the only piece of furniture we had in our living room where you could sit upright somewhat off the ground. So my first couch was a mattress on the floor. So again, the equivalent of cinder block and plywood bookcases, right? I had a mattress, which was fine. I was 21 or 22 years old and just starting out and it worked for me. When I moved to Los Angeles, I think in my first shared apartment, my roommate must have had a couch because I didn't buy one at that point. And then about a year later, I moved in with a roommate in West Hollywood, and this is when I bought my first bona fide couch. I seem to recall I bought it at Montgomery Wards. They were still in business back then. It was a, sh a floor model, and it was on sale. And I want to say I spent $220 on it. I, I'm sure I charged it because I wouldn't have had that kind of cash at that point. I probably financed it. There was, in all likelihood, some kind of financing promotion because I had a Montgomery Wards credit card because I had worked there through high school and college. That first couch was gray, um, like a fake velvety kind of brushed fabric. Gray was very big in the 80s because this would have been 1986. And I had a Nagel lithograph on the wall, which you just have to Google Nagel. I was very 80s. Nagel, gray couch, it was very groovy. And that would be my couch for quite a long time. So then I moved into a one-bedroom apartment in West Hollywood, and the couch followed me. And then, for those of you who listened to the podcast Unexpected Family, then I moved into the duplex with my cousin Susie. Now, Susie had a great couch. Her couch was big and soft and lots of pillows. It was cream colored and it had a chaise attachment. So they still make them, but they were very big in the eighties where you would have the couch and then a chaise attached to it. So you could lay down on the chaise. And so we immediately decided that her couch was far superior to mine. And so her couch would go in the living room. It was a great choice because it looked gorgeous there. And my gray couch would go into the third bedroom, the guest room, which we didn't really use a whole lot. So the gray couch lived in the guest room. Now, if you remember from an unexpected family episode, Susie and I got dogs. I got my dog Tessa and she got her puppy Mike. I mentioned that he's a puppy because every puppy I have ever had chews stuff. And before I go and throw the shade onto Mike for chewing stuff, my dog Tessa, who was four years old when I got her, chewed a lot of stuff too. And she chewed Susie's stuff. So again, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not I am not shaming Mike in any way when I tell you this story, but during Mike's puppy days, he ate a corner of the gray sofa. Now, the thing was, is if he was going to choose a sofa to eat in our house, better that it was the gray sofa, because by this point, I was over it. You know, we moved it in so we would have a piece of furniture there, but I was kind of over it. I really loved Susie's much better. And um, so Mike ate part of the gray sofa, and that really was the beginning of the end. 
of the gray sofa. So just a moment of silence for the gray sofa and the end of its life. And again, Tessa, I chewed up a lot of stuff in our house too. So again, no blame, no shame on beautiful Mike. (laughs) And I have to acknowledge him because if he had to pick a sofa to eat, better that it was mine. And, um, okay, there's another story coming up about how Tessa ate all of my diet books. Really, she did. For some reason, she would pick my diet books and chew them up as if she was giving me the message, Mama, you don't need these. She was a very wise dog. Okay, but we're on couches now, not things that my dog ate. So the next couch that came into my family, if we can call it that, would be a couch that I purchased when I moved to New York. So if you heard the dresser story, you know about how I moved to New York for a year. And I ordered this big, was big, cream colored sofa that was really deep when you sat on it, at least for me, I'm five foot six. When I sat on it with my back against the back cushions, my feet didn't touch the ground. I don't know why I bought such a monstrosity. It was really big and it was expensive and it was custom made. I mean, the whole time I was in New York, I made a lot of weird decisions. So that was my couch for a long time, and I never loved it. Like It wasn't comfortable, I didn't like the way it looked, but I'd spent, I don't know, whatever I spent on it, $1,000 at the time. And so I forced myself to continue to have this couch. And then when I moved to back to Los Angeles, the couch came with me. So that was my couch for a while. But somewhere in, so let's see, I moved back to Los Angeles in 96, I think. And here's what was happening. Sorry, my neighbor's dog is barking. Hopefully they will stop. Um, Here's what was happening in terms of design in 96. Shabby chic was a big thing. And slip covered sofas with big rolled arms and mismatched fabric was a huge thing. And I was obsessed. I still love that style so much. Rachel, I think it's Rachel Ashwell of Shabby Chic, I'm sorry if I'm getting her name wrong, um, had created this movement and typically, sorry, there's a siren. It's loud here this morning. Um, everything's okay though. Don't worry. Um, sorry. So she had developed the style of taking these big, comfy couches with rolled arms and then slip covering them with a slip cover that was a little bit too big for the piece of furniture. So it was kind of slouchy and purposefully messy. And there would be one kind of fabric, let's say on the top of the cushion, another one on the bottom, another one on the front of the arm or the back cushion and they were gorgeous gorgeous I tell you and the slip covers could be laundered they could be washed and I had a dog and so I was tired of having a dirty sofa and there were a couple of different furniture stores in Culver City that specialized in them. And I would go and wander and they were very expensive. I, I want to say they were like $2,200. So this would have been 96. So that was a lot of money back then. And I was, I said this already, but I was obsessed with them. I loved them so much and I couldn't afford one. 
So on weekends, I would go and I would visit my dream couches <laughs> and wish upon a star that I could have one. And then I found a furniture store in L.A. that didn't do that style, but they did the slip-covered sofas. So I got, I ordered, it was a custom, this really beautiful slip-covered sofa. It was a yellow floral in a really, in what I think is a really beautiful way, not your grandmother's floral couch. It was kind of this faded, shabby, chic fabric. I'm sorry, my neighbor's dog is going at it again. Hold on. <laughs> you know what? Every time I go to pause the recording, the dog stops. Now there it goes again. So we're just going to, let's think of this as ambiance, shall we? Hopefully it's not going to come through too much on the recording. So, hold on. Okay. I think they've stopped for now. Back to my couch, because that's way more interesting than my neighbor's dog. So, it was this really faded, like, light buttercup yellow with flowers on it. And they, it was a slip cover, which is what I'd wanted. And it had the rolled arms and I loved this couch. I think it cost about $1,200, as I recall. And I loved the couch. And unfortunately, it was not very comfortable. But that's life. At this point, I was very much into the aesthetic of things. And so I made do. I used extra pillows to prop up my back so my back wouldn't hurt. I lived a good life with this sofa. When I launched Illuminating Souls, it was still in my life, and that sofa was there for my first classes. So the people who were in my early spiritually-based writers group and my mystical ascension group sat on that sofa. And I have had many, many beautiful moments with my floral yellow sofa. But alas, when I moved to Vallejo to be with Wes, I had to give away the sofa because he already had one. So he wound up getting another slip-covered sofa. This was a sleeper sofa, which was good for when guests came over, and it was brown, and it had the blended fabrics, right? Like there was a different kind of fabric on one side of the cushion than on the other, which I loved. And so that sofa served us for a really long time. And I will say, though, I have one kind of funny, funny, um, semi-traumatic story about that sofa. So, you know, I'm a big girl, been a big girl my whole life. And I'm not a delicate creature. Like I plop onto things, pieces of furniture, which perhaps I should not do being a bigger girl. But, you know, hey, I'm somebody who wears clogs and I like comfort and <laughs> physical grace is not my, um, not what I'm known for. And one day, I just must have plopped onto the sofa, and it broke. Not all the way, but it's like all of a sudden the cushion was sinking down. Like some bracket somewhere had given way. And I was mortified and embarrassed, and Wes was not home. He was at work. And I called him up, crying. I'm like, I'm so sorry. I broke the couch. I'm too big. <laughs> and, and really, let me tell you, if you are planning on having a life partner, pick a really good one. Because there are many, many times that Wes 
proved to me that he's the right person for me, and that was one of them. He thought it was funny, but not funny like, you know, I'm going to embarrass you. But he said, it's okay. It'll be okay. We'll try and fix it. And if we can't fix it, we'll get another one. It's okay. He didn't shame me in any way or make me feel bad. He's like, I'll look at it when I get home. And for now, sit on the other side of the couch. (laughs) He's very practical. So he came home and I was just all embarrassed. And he's like, oh, this bracket just is it broke. Don't worry about it. And he, he got a bunch of wood pieces and stacked them up so that it supported the couch. He's like, look, it's wood. It's not going anywhere. Like he created this, basically this wood block that he put under my side of the couch. Cause I don't know, as, as a couple, I don't know how it is for you, but we've always had his side of the couch and my side of the couch, not in terms of territory, but you know, each one of us gets used to sitting on a certain side of the couch. And it worked for years. For years it worked. And um, so that's how I broke the couch and my husband fixed it, which is a metaphor for our lives. My husband fixes everything. He has a solution and a plan for anything that goes amiss. My husband's on it. I married a MacGyver in the most wonderful way possible. Although he does not have a mullet, which is good. (laughs) Remember MacGyver's mullet? Um, That was so cool back then. Anyways, I digress. So this is the part of the story where that sofa must give way to the power recliner we now have. And this is how that happened. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> this is this is the part where if it was a movie, we would, now it would be like present, well, it still wouldn't be present day, but it would be like 2016. And there would be some dramatic music playing, perhaps, if this were. Anyways, um, can you tell that I'm punchy? <laughs> okay, hopefully you're asleep. And, um, and you're not thinking, what the heck is she talking about now? Okay, so it's 2016. We still have that awesome sofa that I broke and Wes fixed. And we are living a good life with it. And our cat is now in our life and he sits in the middle, although he sits in my spot when I get up, as all cats do. And I would have to battle him for my spot back. And more often than not, he would win. And I would sit in the middle. But we had, we had something happen. Which was, we discovered we had mold. Now, I don't want to make this a super sad story about mold. I don't want to bring up any trauma for anyone. But let me just say that having mold in your house really sucks. And it sucked really bad. And as part of the remediation process, we couldn't turn on our air conditioner or our fans because each room had to be remediated and there were plastic curtains that were set up between the rooms as they cleaned each one. And every single thing had to be cleaned. And the things that couldn't be cleaned had to be tossed. And the sofa had to go. Now, by this time, just the sofa having to go was not a tragedy because it had begun to show its life and and. My husband's back always hurt when he sat on it, so we knew we were due for another sofa. So they carried that out to the dumpster, and that was the end of that sofa, but we needed another sofa. This is where the sofa, as the metaphor for the clogs, comes in. So I'm exhausted, and 
profoundly overwhelmed by the whole remediation process. All my stuff is up, right? I don't feel well. I am tired. It's a money issue, right? Because it costs a lot of money. And I have to get another couch right away because we need somewhere to sit. And what I didn't really realize is you just can't go out and buy a couch if you're looking for a couch that you like because couches can take six to ten weeks to get delivered and forget about a custom couch and it was really hot this would have been March and it was a heat wave so I'm in this house with no circulation and it's a hundred and something degrees And I'm overwhelmed. And I have to find a couch. And so I was going to different furniture stores trying to find sofas that we would like, that were comfortable, that would work for us. And at some point, since the last time I shopped for a couch, which was my beautiful yellow shabby chic couch, Somehow, by 2016, the design aesthetic became minimalism. So couches had very square, thin arms. They were gray or cream or taupe. No such thing as a slip cover or a rolled arm. You know, basically, I was out of style. And... Everything that I saw, I hated. Everything I sat in was uncomfortable. Physically and emotionally, I was exhausted and it was so hot. And so anytime I went into a store with air conditioning, it was like nirvana. And so one day in my crabby, overwhelmed, earth girl, uncomfortable space, I go into a local furniture store here in Vallejo. And I'm trying to explain to the salesperson what I want. And they have a couple of these huge power recliner sofas you know, the kind, the kind that goes in the man cave, you know, there, there's nothing stylish about them. They're big with the rolled arms and the puffy back. And really they are made to be comfortable, not to be stylish. And I can't remember if the salesman said to sit in it. I don't remember if I sat in it on my own volition or if they suggested I sat in it. I don't remember. But somehow my butt wound up in that couch. But it was the couch at this point. And I sat down and he said, hit the side button, which is what you do in a power recliner, and my legs elevated and I had been so uncomfortable like physically uncomfortable that it was like clouds were cushioning my butt (laughs) and my feet and my ankles that were so tired and swollen were all of a sudden elevated and I heard the metaphoric angel sing. I was like, this is the most comfortable thing I have ever experienced. And I was torn because it was so ugly. I was like, I I can't be a person who has this sofa. This does not fit with who I am. (laughs) You know, when you want your surroundings to reflect who you are, Like I had already stretched into the me that accepted that I am someone who wears clogs. 
but I was struggling to accept that I would be the me who would have a brown, fake, leather, poofy power recliner in my living room. <laughs> like, wait, when did that happen? And I was not going to get it. And I went home and I told Wes about my experience in this with this sofa. And he said, well, we should go look at it. I said, no, we can't get it. It is so ugly. And he insisted. And so we went and he saw my face again when I sat in it. And he said, we have to get it. You are the happiest I've seen you in months. <laughs> Which I think really speaks to how much life was sucking at that moment <laughs> because of the mold and some other stuff. Now, now here's where it gets even worse. So at first I had been sitting on the couch version of that, which was basically a three-seater couch, and on either end there was a power recliner. But wait, there was a love seat version that had two recliners plus that section in the middle that you would lift up to put your TV guide and your remotes and two cup holders. Like, it gets worse. There's cup holders. And he said, you know, this would, this would fit better in our house. The other one's too big. And I said, you know what? We cannot be the people who have a love seat with two recliners and cup holders. They and I live in Vallejo. This cannot be my life. Like, I am cool Laurel from Los Angeles. I had a cool, shabby, chic sofa. I cannot be Laurel who lives in Vallejo with an ugly, brown, fake, leather, poofy recliner, like a captain's chair with cup holders. <laughs> I was so conflicted. And Wes was very excited. He said, it'll be perfect. The cat will sit on the center console. That's what it's called, a console. It's a center console. He says, the cat will be on the center console. And he was very excited about this whole idea. He's like, you're going to be comfortable. That's what's important. And the cat will have his own place. And we'll have cup holders. <laughs> and... I, I acquiesced. I was like, okay, all right, okay. This is now my life. I must accept the circumstance of my life. This is now my life. And I also had said to him, but here's the thing. This means we can't have people over. Do you know how antisocial it is for us to have the only piece of comfortable furniture in our living room be a two-piece love seat. Like, we want to have people over. We have nowhere to seat people. And he said, ah, oh, we'll bring in the dining room chairs, <laughs> which are not all that comfortable. And we have a piano bench. I said, this is very antisocial. This is not going to be good for our social life because, you know, we have nowhere gracious to sit people. Basically, you and I get a seat and they have to stand <laughs> This is, this is not good, that this is who we are becoming. But he loved the idea of the, the, um, the power recliner, and I loved the idea of that kind of comfort, and they could deliver it right away. That was, that was it. That was, that was the, the final straw. They could deliver it that week. And so, we got this power recliner, brown, ugly, incredibly comfortable and practical love seat as our sofa. And we have had it ever since. We got it in 2016. And while the cat was alive, yes, he was on the console quite often. I use the cup holders every single day. <sighs> the console now more often than not holds my iPad um, and I sit in that thing every day and I push that button and my feet go up 
and I am happy. So that is the story of how I went from someone who really wanted a fashionable sofa that spoke to who I was and perhaps this sofa now speaks to who I am and I was thinking about this this morning as I was getting ready to record this episode I don't even wear clogs anymore I now wear gym well okay so I call them gym shoes they're also called athletic shoes right there's all kinds of names for them but I put them on first thing in the morning and that's all I wear. I don't even know that my foot would know what to do if I had to put on a dress shoe. I wear bike shorts and yoga shorts, so nothing has a real waistband on it. I, I wear comfort. I am all about comfort in my life right now. So... We have a beautiful bed, which is a Tempur-Pedic mattress that just supports my body. We have a two-seater low seat recliner. <laughs> so if you ever come to visit us, I will give you one of the love seat power recliner chairs to sit in. <laughs> will not make you sit on the piano bench. And that's, that's the evolution of 40 years of my life as told <laughs> through my sofas. I do dream at some point of getting a different sofa, which I know my, Wes would not want. I, I would like a bigger one that kind of curves around so more people could sit, but our house, as I have shared with you before, is very small and our living room is very small and the one that we have right now is highly practical and the truth is we are not social people and we rarely have people over now especially because of the pandemic and so it works for who we are right now I am though personally hoping the shabby chic giant slip covered floral sofas make a comeback at some point in my lifetime because I will be getting one of those should they come back in style. Every once in a while I google slip covered sofas to see if they might be back in rotation. Every once in a while I'll see one. But I love that style and everything comes back in style at some point. And so I'm holding out hope that, you know, at some point in my remaining years, which I hope are many, shabby chic slip covered floral sofas will be the in thing again and I will be able to get one. I don't know where we would put it because I can't imagine ever living without a power <laughs> recliner again. It's like I can't ever imagine not wearing comfortable shoes again. Like, it's a slippery slope. Once you go down it, you're not going back. You're not going back. Mm -mm. Like, you couldn't pay me enough now. Well, you could. I mean, if it was a lot of money, I would um, wear uncomfortable shoes again. But the reality is nobody's going to pay me a lot of money to wear uncomfortable shoes. So I don't ever plan on wearing uncomfortable shoes again. Or having a couch that does not simply envelop me in comfort. So, is it any surprise I love bedtime so much? I have segued into the part of life where I am all about comfort and ease. <laughs> so, My Many Couches by Laurel Bleed and Maffei. Thank you very much. <laughs> so perhaps you have furniture that tells a story. These are my stories. And I don't know that this is going to be a whole series because I don't know that I have many other pieces of furniture to tell you about. But for now, we did it. We made it through an episode and hopefully you are asleep. And if you are not asleep, you are amused. And you know what? Before we wrap this up, 
I need to make an addendum, if you will. I think the likelihood is pretty high that some of you in our listening family might have a couch similar to our power recliner love seat. And I do not want you to think for a moment that I am judging your furniture as ugly. (laughs) I realized as I was sharing with you with humor about our furniture journey that I am not lumping everyone who makes this choice of furniture in with my experience. I don't know why I feel like I should say that, but I just want you to know I recognize that Ah, we all create our homes the way they serve us. And there is really something to be said about a beautiful, cushy recliner sofa. And so I hope that you will take everything that I share with a sense of humor, because that is how I mean to share it with you. And I love that we get to share the different stories of our lives And thank goodness, comfort is an option. I'm so grateful to have lived long enough that I value comfort. (laughs) That's wonderful. And perhaps in the future, some brilliant designer will somehow be able to blend shabby chic with a power recliner. And it will be beautiful. I can dream of a brighter tomorrow. (laughs) So thank you so much for letting me share a little bit of my life with you. I'm so deeply grateful for you. So my beloved friend, I send you love. And I wish you sweet dreams and goodness and a beautiful, comfortable couch that you love. (laughs) And I thank you very much for giving me the blessing of spending this time with you. We'll talk again soon. Thank you.